Welcome back to the Compound Podcast. This is episode 137. Please be 137. Brought to you by Parse Rum. I love Parse. You love Parse. Zach, it's your turn to say something nice about Parse. I mean, do you not want to save save the earth and plant some trees while you get some new bottles, especially in the holiday season? Buy all of them. Send them out. Get some get some people on it. I'm not kidding when I say there's no better time of the year than right now to drink Parse rum. I was just in the Boston area. It was cold. It was real cold. And you know what I could have gone for? Some Parse rum. And then to I got warm, back to Austin. To warm me up a little bit? Oh, I got back to Austin. It was cold. It's cold here. And I said, I'm going to go. And right now I'm going to break out some Parse rum out of the cabinet. And I'm going to have a little, a little hot toddy with a little Parse. People do mix in some, mix in some eight year and do a hot toddy. Why not? Parse cool. rum three is- year. Wait, stop. I have a good things to say. Parse rum. They got a three year. Okay, you got a three year. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you're, you got the holidays coming up. You got people coming in. Mix that up. Give me, make them a little, make them a little rum drink. You want to sip on it? Maybe a little, maybe a little eight year. You want to go twelve year? You want to impress somebody? You got maybe, maybe you got a father in law coming in. Maybe you got a little somebody you want to give a little twelve year to. Come on now, Zach. Are you recording in a dungeon? I just turned the light off. It was kind of bright. You know, no, the light's better. Light's better. Yeah, it's definitely right. better with the light. You ever think about um, taking that cord from your TV and hiding it, or brother? This is this is like the attic up here, man. I'm just asking. I was just asking. It's Shoddy's hey, house. It ain't. Why don't you house. put? Why don't Why don't you get some more art on your wall back there? I got hey, some, he's got see, a I moved cooler the, wall. I moved, I moved the desk. I moved the desk. So now I got a little. Got a little something there. I got a little something. I got a little background. Don't look like a serial killer anymore. All, All right. Time. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Got some stuff going on. Burhalter out. But, do you want to talk about USA for a minute? You want to talk about I USA? I do. I do. Come on. Because tell people. Tell them, Dakota. Fucking tell them. Greg Burhalter is a fucking idiot. He's an idiot. He. We have our best player. Nah, not our best player. One of our top three players. Tom, would you agree? He's probably one of our top three players. Certainly a top five player on the squad. Giovanni Reina. We just don't use him. We say, hey, let's bring in an MLS guy. Let's bring in a couple MLS players. Listen, 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 listen. There's a reason they're playing the MLS. Put it this way. This is like, here's how I can compare it. And this could sound mean. Don't care. This is like having a Team USA and you're putting in a guy that's playing in Korea and you got Nolan Arenado on the bench. I'm like, I don't know. Maybe maybe we should use <laughs> like our best player and try to score another goal because we just choked it, giving up a penalty in the 81st minute. And Dakota, who, who, Dakota, Dakota, who gave up the penalty? Was it another MLS Walker guy? Walker Zimmerman. I wonder what league he plays uh, in. Oh, Nashville, yeah, Nashville SC. The, the great, the the great club. Nashville SC. Can I ask <sighs> a soccer question? Yeah. If you're a top five player on the team, how are you not starting? Yeah, why? Well, positionally, we have a I lot was of midfielders. okay with him not starting because he plays the same position as Pulisic and uh, Wea, and they both are really good. They combine for the goal. I mean, he could play like the midfield, but then you got – you're not going to know any of these names, Ian or Zach. Uh, but then you got like Weston McKenney, who's really good, kind of the heart and soul of the team. Tyler Adams is the captain. He's the best hey, eight four five. Tyler Adams, I know him. No, and then Eunice Don't Musa know. was the other guy that started. He's like 19 years old, and he's a freak. So, like, it, it was okay. I was fine that he didn't start, but not putting him in at all, especially once they equalized, blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. And now that they need a good run against England. I mean, they don't uh, – yeah, kind of. If they draw against England and beat Iran, they'll, they should be in because England should spank Wales, hopefully. We need England to just dominate Wales, and we need to, like, draw with England and then beat Iran to move on. But it would, if, oh, if we would have won that, we would have held the fate in our own hands of saying we just need to beat Iran and we're, and we're in. Hey, Dakota, instead, you know what this, this reminds me of? Huh? The Jets. Defeating me as well. Yeah, it's kind of like that, except the Patriots are better than the Jets, and the the they're not, way, they're Wales not. is not better than the USA. And we and they're, they're not stuff. better. They're not better. We than the Jets. used MLS players. Can we, <sighs> can we just, talk they, about? I've been looking forward to this Ian for eight years, and it broke my heart. That's all I got to say. I know. I know. Let's talk. Let's talk about something that's a little bit more uplifting. Our good friend, friend of the pod, Anthony Rizzo, got paid. A little bit of a little bit of dough. Our good friend signed a two for 34 with a six million dollar buyout. So that means that he is essentially guaranteed two for 40, which we love. 
And then he also has $17 million uh, option for that third year, which could be three for 51. Really happy for our friend. We'll go for, for a friend. He's rich. Back I in New York. Cubs made a late push for him, too. Me, me. Uh, Tom, I know there's a lot going on over there. Do you, have, do you care to have a comment on your your boys picking Riz back up? Uh, very great signing. I was with Jimmy actually when we found out. Obviously, a lot of excitement in the office. And I think the thing most people are thinking about is that we're hoping because obviously he's been pretty close with. Uh, we have a lot of different nicknames for him on the show. I'll go with Judgy since that's what Scott calls him. Uh, Judgy. And we're hoping that this is the first half of a package deal and Aaron Judge comes back. So if that's what this is leading towards, this is all worth it. Rizzo had a great year. And Ian, I'll be curious to see. What you think about this, there's been a lot of discussion about how the shift and the lack there of, of a shift now will affect him going forward. Yeah, Jimmy actually texted me about um, about Yankee Stadium and about the uh, left-handed BABIP. For everyone out there, batted, batting average on balls in play is BABIP. So Yankee Stadium is a relatively small outfield um, as far as square feet, and it is also in uh, right field the smallest so there's not a lot of area for guys especially left-handed guys that pull the ball to get hits through the shift as if you can think about Coors Field being absolutely massive there's a lot of area for balls to fall and I Riz is as the projections go a like top five guy in the league that gets hurt by the shift the most because of where they play and because of where he hits his balls um, I think it's going to make a huge impact on him I also think he has the ability with two strikes to put the ball in play and put the ball in play hard to the right side. He got four man outfield, four man outfield. They did a lot this year. Um, and I think that, they did. I think the one thing that people aren't thinking about when you talk about the shift besides the raw numbers and Zach, you can speak to this. When you get up and you see guys all stacked on one side of the field, it is, it's just demoralizing from a confidence perspective because you look out there and you go, if I hit a ball to the right side, doesn't matter how hard I hit it. If I, I have to either topspin, hook a ball to the right field line, I have to hit a laser in the gap, or I have to hit a homer, I don't have a lot of options as far as like places to hit the ball to get hits. And I think psychologically, once guys see a more open field and there's more places to get hits, it gives you the confidence to go up there, put on a good hack on a good pitch, and feel like you're going to get a result. It, it's so hard as a human to, when you see that shift, to not try to like manipulate your swing, to try to beat the shift. Like when I first got shifted in like high A by the Astros, shocker that they were the first team that I've seen. Which was do insane it. that it was an A ball. That yeah. And like I get up there and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to fish for like three in a row and they're never going to shift me again. And it's like, that's exactly what they want you to try to do. It's like, get out of your comfort zone and try to, and like, yeah, you know, people always say, oh, look at that hole, just do it. And it's like, yeah, I get it, but I can guarantee you most of the people who get hits over there, aren't trying to hit the ball over there. It just kind of happens. And like, you yeah. pitch when a guy's boring a two seam in on your hands, you're not going to do that. I'd right. say the only time and by no means am I saying it's easy. I, I could not do it. I'd say the only time I feel like you have a chance at that, just kind of throwing it over there is like, Oh, two count, like two strike count. And you're like, Oh, they're trying to bury a slider. Like ah, flick it over there. Right. And that's just like more that? of a, that's more of a product of like letting it, letting it get deep. And you're yeah. not, nobody's walking up there and saying, I'm going to beat the shift this at bat. I can promise you. I think it's also, I think. I can thing, see Rizzo walking up there and being like, fuck it. I'm beating the shift. I'm hitting I can see you doing heads. that too. I, I mean, can. for sure. But there's also like the ability as a hitter to sell out to the pull side and hook something and like dive out over the plate and say like, I'm going to, I'm going to pull this ball hard. And I don't care if it's on the ground or in the air. Like that's a lot easier to do. Then the feeling, I think it's hard to describe this, but the feeling of hitting a ball the other way tends to make you really late because you're trying to hit it the other way. You're trying to catch it deep and you're trying to really manipulate it that way. And with guys throwing 98 with ride, like that's really hard. And, but the opposite is you have more room for error when you try to be really early and hook something. And I think you're going to see some more balls come back into the game. That's like first and third guy has to first baseman has to hold the runner on that four hole gets really big that between the first baseman, the second baseman, and you're going to see some more guys be able to feel like they can just hit a really hard ground ball to the right side 
might go right at the first baseman, right, might not, but you have more ability because that hole becomes bigger to actually utilize that as opposed to man on third, first and third, less than two outs, that shift is going on. So anything to the right side of double play, you don't get the run in, and then now you're looking to only hit the ball in the air in a place where you can actually drive drive that run in. So I, I think there's a lot of little things that come into play with the shift, but um, I think Rizzo will be one of the guys that benefits from it the most. Let's talk about the Hall of Fame ballot. You guys see the Hall of Fame ballot? I looked at it briefly. It's a lot of people's last year on it, correct? I think there's a few. I'd like to. I just like to preface this conversation by I saw uh, someone reporter person say um they said like oh, there's one or one or two names that were interesting and they basically said like besides that doesn't look like there's a lot of people making compelling cases there's people on this ballot i have to now let me just find it really quick but there's people on this ballot that to say like ah, not really compelling case you have andy pettit you have billy wagner who is statistically one of the best relievers to ever pitch uh Manny Ramirez, he said Manny Ramirez and uh, A-Rod were the two that were interesting, but the steroid stuff. Besides those guys, you have Billy Wagner, who's one of the best relievers of all time. You have Omar Vizquel, who I believe has 13 gold gloves. Lackey, I played with, and I absolutely love. He has an amazing postseason record and some incredible longevity. Uh, Andrew Jones has 10 gold gloves and was one of the best players in the league for 8 to 10 years. Not sure how that's not a strong case. Uh, Carlos Beltran. I mean, you have a lot of guys on this list that it's like, I mean, if you look at their numbers within their era, Todd Helton, I mean, you look at those guys' numbers within their era, it's like, we're not considering these guys. It's, See, go ahead. I lean on the side of the Hall of Fame is the best of the best of the best. Not the best of their era. It's the best of ever. Like, you, I compare hall of fame numbers like to get into hall of fame i compare your numbers to everyone not like oh at the time he was the best player because i'm like i don't care like at the time he was the best player but he's the but today he'd be the 50th best player then he's not a hall of famer to me are you comparing him to sandy koufax or baby the stats, Ruth? who are we comparing the stats, him to not, the guys that played in the northeast repertoire. against only white dudes and there's 10 not teams? their repertoire who are we comparing I'm him saying to? their stats i'm saying their stats line up todd helton stats next to uh I can't even think of another Hall of Famer right now. You got me all frazzled. Tom, please pull Todd Helton's stats next to another first baseman Hall of Famer. Please. I not just want to 19, point this not out. Not from like the 40s. I want to point this out. Andy Pettit's a three-time All-Star. Took uh, He played 18 years. He's a three-time All-Star. People will probably hold that against him for not having more All-Star games. He tested positive for rights. He's out. In 2005, he went 17-9 and nine with a 2-3-9. Made 33 starts through 221 innings. Uh, and was not an all star. Not sure how that happened. He also, could, he could have made an all star every single year and had twenty five wins a year, and he still wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame because Barry Bonds isn't in the Hall of Fame, and he's the also, best of all time. I'm pretty sure he has. I'm pretty sure he has the most postseason innings of all time. He does. Um, and with two hundred and seventy six, that's hilarious. Todd Helton <laughs> hit three. Todd Helton hit three sixteen with a four fourteen OBP, five thirty nine slugging, nine fifty three career OPS. Uh, 369 homers, 1400 RBIs. Is that good? Homers aren't going to do it. Then get to 500. Uh, I have the stats. If you want to compare him to Frank Thomas, how many guys are in the 500 Homer club? I'm just going to keep asking you questions, Tom. 20 ish. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Oh my God. In 2000, he had 372. What does that have to do with anything? <laughs> he had 372 one year. I'm saying. You're sitting here making a case for a guy that did roids. I mean, Frank Thomas hit 301 with 521 and 1700 uh, RBIs. So he hit 15 points lower, pretty much the same OPS, but he hit 200, like 160 more homers and 300 more RBIs. Sorry, 500 more, 300 many, more RBIs. How many years did he did Frank Thomas play? Uh, 19 and Todd Helton played 17. That's pretty comparable. You're saying he's hitting 40 more in each season if he plays two more? Come on. I tried to pick two guys from similar eras who have That's, similar I, stats. Yeah. yeah, and I'm saying I, I tend to, yeah, I think I, Frank Thomas had the better career. I, I think everyone would agree. I think Ian's point is that, like, and it, this is what it comes down to. You're a big hall guy or you're a small hall guy. I'm a small hall guy, so I kind of agree too. with Dakota. 
that like it should be reserved for the top of the top. But like if you're a big haul guy, then someone like Todd Helton obviously has a really compelling case and, you know, certainly has an argument to be in the Hall of Fame. Ian, you made an argument for Andy Pettit. Come on. My thing is, at this he's a, point, he's a, he's a steroid guy. But the precedent, yes, I think he even tested positive. Like he was like full blown, like he, like he admitted he took. He, he apologized. He had a press conference. Yeah. And admitted it. My thing is, at this point in time, once Barry Bonds did not get in, if there is anybody ever the rest of time that is even linked to steroids, they shouldn't be in. Because if Barry Bonds didn't get in, no one should. That has possibly taken roids. Would you agree with that, Ian? Yeah, I, I think that's a good argument. I just, you know, what I get frustrated with is people who are writing things who say, like, not just not a lot of compelling stories. Like, these guys had unbelievable career. It's, and I think, you know yeah. what else? It's an amazing accomplishment to be on the ballot. Oh, yeah. It's an amazing, and we, I don't think we as a baseball community talk about it enough how unbelievable of an accomplishment it is to be on the ballot. Could My you- good friend, our first base coach, Mike Napoli, made the ballot. And when that happened, when he made the ballot and that came out, I was like, dude, that's the coolest thing ever. Congratulations. You are an absolute stud. Have to have made the ballot for the major league hall of fame is and I see funny. you have to play, you have to play long enough, you have to post, you have to stay healthy. Like that's insane to get you yeah. put on the ballot. And yeah. I, I know what you're saying, like not making the hall of fame like makes their career like kind of like forgotten like in Todd Helton had an unbelievable career like there's a lot of guys that had unbelievable careers but it's like I'm just with Tom on the side of the hall of fame should be like the elite of the elite like it shouldn't be like oh five six guys a year it's like no like I want I want years there's nobody like I think wasn't there nobody last year like I like that can I can I give you a another take I think we should care more about individual teams hall of fame I think like Todd Helton is a Rockies a Rocky Hall, Hall of Famer. Famer. Oh, hundred percent. And like, but, like that's really cool. And I what think about people- guys like if Judge goes and plays ten years now for the Angels, who's he going the Hall of Fame as? Are you reporting Judge to the Angels? I'm simply stating. Uh, you've been, you've been talking I'm, to I'm our guy Scotty. I'm that's saying a good if question. Judge that's goes and question. plays somewhere else the rest of his career. That's a good question, but I think like you know he'd still be a Yankee Hall of Famer if like he'd be, the Yankee- he will. I think he'll probably be a Hall of Famer for the Yankees no matter what. And then maybe he'll be a Hall of Famer in another place too. But like, I think baseball is in a little bit of a place where guys play in so many different places now and it's, they're not at one team forever and it's different. But I do think like that individual team's Hall of Fame is a really awesome honor too. I got to, we got to watch, um, who was it that got inducted into the Giants Hall of Fame? Um, right at the end of the year. And that was a really, really cool ceremony to watch. I have a counterpoint to Tom saying that judge will for sure be in the Yankees hall of fame. I that's like monument park. I'd say like monument park is Yankees hall of fame. If he leaves the Yankees right now, he's not going to monument park. No way. I don't know. He broke the American league. No, home run record. I, no, they I, don't just hand out monument park. They kind of, they kind of do. There. They kind of do hand out monument park. There's I'm a lot of guys in monument park. Let me take a look. number eight's retired twice. I mean, they, they kind of handed out a little hey, bit. Hey, that's from back in the day. And Tori was a great manager. We got to watch Will Clark go into the hall of fame. Sorry. Will Clark. We got to watch Will Clark go into the hall of fame in San Fran. And that was really awesome. Sorry. No, I was just going to say I'm ramped up on. You're saying judge is already in the Yankees hall of fame. And I'm saying I I don't agree with that. I don't think he is because, all right, there are some guys that I've not heard of, but these are like, yeah. Also Joe Torre, Joe Torre were six, eight retired for Bill ah, and Yogi Berra. So that's right. That did feel that felt wrong. Yankees. I I mean, you can't wear any number if you play for the Yankees now, but I mean, like numbers, you're not going to have any numbers to wear. Everybody's going to be 96. I'm, I'm saying judge will have like a lot of these guys I'm seeing on here played like 10 plus years like one of the shorter ones was paul o'neill but he was like an all-time yankee like he was like one of those different time in baseball though those guys played 27 years because there was no one to replace them they played until they didn't have knees anymore and they were selling newspapers and the other and before the games Ian, what year do you think Paul O'Neill played? Yeah, what yeah, year do you think you, Paul I'm O'Neill talking played? about the other guys. I'm not talking about Paul O'Neill. I'm talking about like Paul going, O'Neill played for 22 years for the Yankees. Paul yeah, O'Neill wasn't selling. News they were also selling the sandwiches. Quarter. I'm just. I think. I do not think Judge currently would go in Monument Park because he hasn't won anything either. There's no titles to his name. There's nothing. 
This is I a hot take. Pro- I think in. I think Dakota, you're now a guest on Talking Yanks. They'll see you next week. I'm you're just debate. They, this is an argument the, I'd go have uh, on Talking Yanks. If they think he should be in the Monument Park, I'll go have this argument. You're gonna judge. Uh, you're gonna judge judges' uh, Hall of Fame potential. He, what would he go in for? For one good season, one unbelievable. season? One good Sorry, season. Doesn't he have two season. MVPs? I'm set. No, I know. I take that. Rookie, back. The, rookie for of the year one, MVP for when he broke this record. But everyone else in Monument Park has a title. I, I am 100 guessing on that, but I feel like that's a good <laughs> chance of that. I mean, hey, it, odds are, odds are they do. One of those. It's like I'm probably right. Like, is anyone going to check it? I just I don't see it. But let's move on. All right, let's, let's get to, to the interview. Else. Let's get to the interview. Okay. We're going to have Roger Steele on. It's brought to you by Muggsy. Before we get into the interview, this interview with Roger Steele, golfer, social media extraordinaire, is brought to you by. Muggsy jeans. You know who would look good in Muggsy jeans? Roger Steele. And he's got a lot of companies he's working with. Maybe Muggsy's the next one. Maybe we set him up. Chicago guy, Chicago brand. Muggsy's the best jeans in the world. Most comfortable, most stretchy. Dakota loves them. He has so many pairs. Them. And uh, and they're doing 30% off the entire website. Early access Black Friday sale. It's early access. It's Black Friday. It's not quite Black Friday yet, but they're already giving you the sale so you can get ahead of your shopping. MugsyJeans.com. You don't even need a code. The whole website's thirty percent off. You'll look great. Dakota looks great. Always look great. Muggsy Jeans. Let's go talk to Roger Steele about golf and being an entrepreneur and being all over the country. We got Roger Steele with us joining the Compound Pod. Roger is a golf extraordinaire. I mean, you have so many sponsorships. I don't know if I can even list them, but show <laughs> on Golf Channel. We are both Five Iron Ambassadors. Callaway Golf, you got your own clothing line, Trap Golf, Nike guy. You got all kinds of stuff going on, huh? I know, man. It's kind of like a, it's all happening a little too fast, and I'm trying to keep up with it, you know? Were you, were you just in L.A. doing SoFi stuff? Yeah, yeah. We went out to SoFi Stadium last night, watched the Chargers, uh, Chiefs game. Uh, didn't go too well for my boy Herbert, but, you know, that boy Mahomes is a dog, baby. <laughs> That's a <laughs> sick game. Yeah, you can't you can't do nothing about that. And I feel like I jinxed him a little bit. I bought a jersey as soon as I got to the stadium. Instead of putting it on right when I got it, I waited to the fourth quarter and slipped <laughs> it on. And then the shit just, you know what I mean? It so you were waiting to see how the game went though before you put it on. You're yeah, like, let's see how it goes. <laughs> Look, then then when they scored and it was like a minute left, I'm like, man, I should probably snatch this off. So you know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was just like, man, I'm um I'm, I'm always worried that I'm bad juju for the teams that I try to support. That's why I try to hang in the back, not be seen. But no, it was a good game. So we were in Chicago. So Rogers from Chicago, just for all the listeners. We were in Chicago at a first T charity event recently right. got to connect. We still haven't played golf yet. Right. But it was awesome for you to be there supporting the first tee in Chicago, the project over at Waveland. How, tell us your story, how you got into golf, how you got so involved with it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm born and raised in Chicago. And so my dad is a, a Chicago police officer and around the time I was born, he was, you know, becoming addicted to the sport. So I didn't really have much of an option as far as things that I wanted to do in my spare time. So he was dragging me to the golf course and I didn't really, I didn't resonate with golf as a kid because I'm growing up in Chicago during the Jordan era. And it's like, you know, I'm only six feet tall, but I, you know, I had high hoop dreams, baby. Like you couldn't tell me that I wasn't going to be in the NBA one day. Uh, but no, my dad was, you know, he was making me spend a decent amount of time on the golf course. And, uh, you know, I didn't appreciate it as much as a kid, but having that foundation when I graduated college and then I came back to the game, it was like, man, I, you know, I was just able to advance so much quicker and I understood the game, not just the the way that you play the game, but like the soft skills in the game. Like I had been listening to 40 year old dudes talk golf for so long that, you know, I really developed an appreciation for it on a, on a new level once I was mature enough to handle that, you know. But my dad logic was like, you know, he was seeing things that was happening in and out of the streets of Chicago as a lit for a living. And he was like, man, if I could just keep my son on a golf course, I could really mitigate some of the things that he would be exposed to that could have his life turn sideways because he saw so many kids' lives go the other way uh, on a day in, day out basis. And so I, I really, you know, I, I thank my dad every time I get a chance to for uh, making sure that I had exposure to this game uh, and the opportunities that it's, that it's provided to me as an adult. They just, you know, they've been unparalleled. Like I, I, you would never think like me being from where I'm from and and the network that I had growing up, like to be on this podcast with y'all is crazy. 
you know, like through through a non-professional sports approach for me to use this game of golf and to see the things that I see. And I, and I don't think there's any other sport or undertaking that could provide these type of opportunities to people like me. So it's it, it's been a crazy ride, man. And so you, I know you listed off all them sponsors and stuff, but I appreciate all of them so much for appreciating me and what I stand for and trying to help perpetuate this message of, you know, how we can all grow and build community no matter where we're from. Golf's an it's amazing awesome. game in that way that it's you you really can. You can meet so many different people and build this amazing network. 